Digital transformation is rapidly picking up pace as risk teams continuously bring more processes online. You collect more unstructured data than ever, but we struggle to use it effectively. You are inundated with data from social media threats, incident submissions, and hotline calls. This data comes to you in unstructured language that you don't have time to parse and analyze, potentially leading to missed threats or root causes or a failure to connect the dots. I'm Will Anderson, CEO of Resolver, and today we are here to discuss how Resolver will help you solve this problem. We'll talk about how we're improving the quality of data coming into our platform and how we use artificial intelligence to enrich this data to find patterns that will allow you to catch incidents before they happen. We shifted our focus to helping our customers improve data quality. You know what they say, garbage in, garbage out. Historically, the primary way that security teams collected incidents was by having their security professionals and guards enter them directly into the system. As we looked at this process last year, we still saw a few missing pieces. We deployed several features to ease the burden of frontline reporting to increase engagement. Features like improved address support and the mobile incident submission app helped reduce the complexity on frontline users. They were no longer overwhelmed with long and complicated forms or confused by what we were asking them for. We targeted our first AI feature to further enhance the security process. Many of our customers are global organizations that work with non-English speaking teams. This creates a challenge for collecting data. Do you push non-English users to report in a language that they're not fluent in? Or do you let them write in the language of their choice and sacrifice the understanding of the security team? To solve this issue, we have integrated Amazon Translate into Resolver. We've always supported multilingual labels in Resolver, but in addition, we now also support AI-enabled multi-language user inputs. As an example, like here, a Spanish user can input an incident in Spanish, while the English security team can read it in English. Seeing the data is an essential first step, but the raw data doesn't do much until you transform it in a triage process. This is the process whereby security professionals review incident submissions to categorize and enrich the data to make it more intelligible for both analysis and workflow. This is a critical process, and without this level of data enrichment, you're blind. You can understand what's happening in any one incident, but you can't see the patterns and connections between them. Most teams don't do a great job of triage. It's time consuming, particularly if we're being diligent about accuracy and making sure that we don't create duplicate records. In many teams, workload means that key pieces of information are not flagged, leading to misconnections or a failure to connect the dots. And that's the problem that Resolver set out to solve with our first in-house AR project. What I'm sharing on my screen right now is our intake portal. It's designed to be simple and straightforward, where fields allow for ease of use when untrained staff or trained staff with high turnover must submit incidents to our larger team. Now, as our security team is going to start to leverage the depth and speed of the intelligent triage process after the incident is submitted, we can allow for information entered by the incident submitter to be a lot less structured. Here in this observation as if they were truly rec recounting what they had witnessed in their observation. Another note that Will mentioned earlier here is that as an organization with, officer, with offices in multiple locations, incident collection becomes difficult due to language barrier. Resolver now supports translating a plain text written in an incident submitter's native language, which they can input directly in this observation field, and I'll demonstrate that in just a moment here. Now, submitting this incident is relatively straightforward as we select an observation type. It might prompt us for a location here, maybe a photo and an attachment, but submitting this initial observation is going to route to our triage stage, where all involvement can be populated using our AI text analysis. Within our triage state here, we'll see our full observation that was submitted along the left-hand side. We can see our outline of this narrative account of a stolen camera from one of our locations here. Now, just to take a quick pause here, we are viewing this observation in English, but using our machine learning translation functionality, I can actually translate this into the native text. Just by clicking my machine translation functionality here, I can actually see that this observation came into the software in French. I can almost instantly translate it to English, my native language here. Now, jumping directly into that analyzed text in our intelligent triage, we'll notice a few gray boxes here. Now, these gray boxes are our found facts relating to our incident. These facts or entities are currently dates and times, people, organizations, places, and facilities here. 
So we will work our way through our Intel summary on our, on our left-hand side here, which is going to cover the who, the where, the when, and then we'll touch a bit upon the what as we go through this process today. Now, clicking into my first hit in this observation, Bill Haraway, our text analysis has automatically flagged this as a person and also performed a search for Bill through our library. We'll see a single result pop up that Bill Harrowing might be a person involved in this particular record. In this case, in the context of this incident, he is a witness. So I can go through, create his involvement and quickly tag him as a witness here. We'll see that on the left-hand side here in our dynamic Intel summary to the left, filling out the who, we'll see Bill's name pop up directly. We'll also see that his name has changed from gray to yellow, just showing the quick progression of this particular observation here. We're going to see the progression of analysis through our intelligent triage, through our gray found facts turning into our relative colors in terms of our Intel summary. But we can also take a step back and look at that relationship graph quickly again. Now, in this relationship graph, we can see that a few more connections have already been established here. And as I further drill into these connections, I can see that Tristan has also been our main suspect in a theft of goods from our warehouse earlier this month. Now, instead of combing through incident records or actually relying on memory to try to make these connections with people, the relationship graph coupled with our intelligent triage streamlines the process and eliminates any discrepancies here. Now, continuing back to our people in terms of our observation, so focusing on the who, I'd like to take a look at Lucas Sparting here, who is another person of interest in this case. So I'd like to link him to this incident. However, we'll see that he's actually not in our system already. So in real time, I can come in and create a quick person. We'll see that his first name and last name are already pulling over from the identified text. I might tag some information around his person type if I know that. I can even load a photo at this point if necessary, but I can instantly create Lucas in our library data here. By creating Lucas, I can then quickly tag his involvement as a person of interest, and he will automatically appear in our Intel summary as well in our larger library to tag him next time his name pops up here. Now, speaking of the when, we'll circle back to our time and dates here, and we'll look at our first date of February 27th here. Now, this is the date that the initial observation was reported by Bill on. Clicking into February 27th shows us, of course, that this is first and foremost tagged as a date for us. And then on the right hand pops up, it directs us to turn this data into larger incident data here. All the date fields that the screener has on the triage form, which we saw earlier on, are found here. This includes your start date, your end date, and ultimately, when was this reported? If we think for whatever reason this date is wrong, we have the flexibility of changing or updating it. But since there were no actual specific times reported here, we're just going to choose that this was reported on February 27th, hit our quick save button, and we'll notice again our date changes from gray to blue, just showing that progression. And now we have a when date field added in our Intel summary. As we go through our progressions of dates within this observation, we can take a look at our second date, which this is the actual incident event here. Now, as we continue on to the who, we're going to look at companies and organizations referenced in this organization. These are still going to focus on our who of the incident and not quite the where just yet. Now, the first company or organization that is referenced within this record here is Tense R Us. They've been encountered and we can hop in and add them as an organization here. One of the key pieces we'll see here, similar to Lucas, is that TensorRS is not a full organization that's been added to our software yet or our library. So at any point, I can create that organization and add them on the fly if necessary. The second organization that has been mentioned here is Worston Publix Works. In this case, it's a known contractor for us, so we can easily create the involvement. We'll see we do have quite a few different search results that are popping up. I can go through and select my relative one. And again, we'll notice that change from orange to from gray to orange. And we'll see worst in public works has now been attributed in the who of our Intel summary. Finally, the last piece I want to take a look at is the where behind the observation. And our ML model here really looks at where in two kinds of ways. And we'll leverage both of them quite fluidly as we go through today. Now, looking at the first one that is identified by the model, it's EEEL. 
contextually, the model knows that this is some sort of building and labels it as a facility here. Basically, it's a physical entity that I can actually go to, but it doesn't have a specific address or is a known landmark. Now, most of our customers in your own locations and abilities will actually be classified as facilities here. When I've opened up this particular building, we'll see that our location search has been performed and a single match is found. In this case, our reporter has actually called the building by its common name, which is an alias for its more formal name, the Electrical Engineer Building, as it can be seen here in our search results. So we're still able to access any of these buildings by our shorthands or aliases, very similar to organizations here. Now, in addition to the location search, the pop-up also proposes what is found as places that might be associated with the selected facilities. Places are those addresses or landmarks that provide direction, such as 123 Main Street that was mentioned next to the electrical engineer building. Places are also searched for within our lo location library to find possible matches using the geolocation information that might be stored on them. Maybe the reporter got the building wrong or it is actually another building on 123 Main Street that should be selected, but the ability to link the two together, we would have wider search, search field and search functionality. We'd be able to choose which building the reporter is actually referencing here. Notice as I optionally select a place here, such as 123 Main Street, the search results now increase. There are a few different locations and a couple different buildings I can actually choose from. It's possible it could be one of those, and now they are available for my selection. This type of comprehensive searching is not available on the standard involvement forms. Now, if I did want to link my electrical engineering building here, I can link that as my reported location and maybe mark it as my primary location in this case here, and I can create an involvement right off the bat. What we'll notice here is that the change of color to both facts here, both our electrical engineering building and our 123 Main Street building are now a selected entity under our where on the Intel summary and have both been tagged as locations within this record here. What we'll see as well is we can tag another building, our ER2, as a place or a facility here. And by tagging this as a facility, it is going to search through a limited set of records just as our one facility and I can create that involvement very similar to how we just looked at our electrical engineering building. Now, as I return back to my initial incident on my triage page here, we can observe all the data that has been captured through the intelligent triage process. We can look at people and organizations, our respective dates, as well as locations that have been reported throughout this observation. I can follow my standardized triage process where I can assign ownerships to either my incident owners and officers, supervisors, or anyone else on my team who might need a bit of access here. I can continue on with this record and move it through my workflow as a full open incident here. But now that we have the who, the where, the when, and someday soon the what details already completed through intelligent triage, we'll be able to streamline that larger incident management process.